Hi everyone, Gideon Cordover here. I'm one of your Kingborough councillors and this is the council roundup for Monday the 15th of August 2022. We've just come back from the council meeting and it was a bit of a marathon. There was a lot to cover in tonight's council meeting. What's the council roundup? Well, this is my personal opinion. It's an opportunity for me to share with you what I believe were some of the highlights and the lowlights of the council meeting and some of the issues that were discussed. Um, not speaking on behalf of council, but obviously you can always go to the council website and you can see all the minutes and the agenda of tonight's meeting. And you can also go to the YouTube channel. And that's really where you can see minute by minute. You can actually see exactly what took place throughout the council meeting. So I really strongly encourage you to check out the YouTube stream. And that way you can see how all the votes went down, who voted for what. And you can um, go through right the, the whole way through the agenda. But it was a long one tonight. And so the first thing that I did at tonight's council agenda uh, was I asked a question without notice. The first one was about neighbourhood noise complaints. I've been receiving a couple of noise complaints. Um, people are basically asking what's the best way to handle those noise complaints. And so the general manager of the council has committed to get back to us on notice with a kind of a step-by-step -step, plan, I guess, of what, what the best ways uh, to handle noise complaints are. And of course, the statutory um, options that council has to manage noise complaints and noise pollution when there are these kind of neighbourhood disputes. The second questions that I asked uh, was a series of questions from the mayor's diary. So the first one was about the uh, site to, uh, site visit to the Blackman's Bay blowhole and also um, just for an update on the Kingborough Dog Walkers Association meeting. Councillor Cordover. Thank you, ma'am. My first question is about neighbourhood noise complaints. So recently a number of constituents have come forward uh, to me with noise complaints and I'm not speaking about any individual noise complaint here, just more generally. As the density of our neighbourhoods continues to increase with near record population growth, what advice does the council have for residents who have a concern about noise emanating from a neighbour's property? Is there a best practice set of steps to take? Um, what action can council take to intervene in such a situation and at what trigger point? And um, yeah, what, what is the best practice um, set of steps that, that uh, people can take where a neighbour is causing noise pollution? General Manager. Through you, Mayor. Whenever we receive a complaint uh, regarding noise emission, Council Cordova, it's uh, directed to our environmental services team uh, who do have uh, some ability under the appropriate legislation to not only investigate but uh, take action if a nuisance is proven. Um, but in relation to the um, rest of your questions, probably best to take it on notice so that we can place it on the public record. Thank you. My next set of questions are about the Mayor's Diary. On the 13th of May, I'm interested to find out a little bit more about the site visit to Blackman's Bay blowhole um, with residents to view fencing. Um, is there some update about the height of the fence? <laughs> I, I'm glad I can remember that one because my COVID brain is still struggling to remember what I did last week. But um, uh, yes, so I've got a quite a substantial report that I was um, given by residents to read. There are, is some concern by some residents about a couple of aspects of the fence. Um, one is in relation to a foothold um, where access has been granted for uh, or is available for people who want to do abseiling. Um, there's quite a distinct looking foothold that could be uh, inappropriately used. Um, but also there was some concerns about the fact that the fence on the southern side is still being, um, people are still walking in front of it to get to where they want to get to rather than staying behind it. So um, yes, that is uh, something that I still have to read the report. Thanks. And so at this stage, is it fair to say that there's no action in the works? Not at this stage, no. Okay, thank you. My next question, final question, is uh, regarding the meeting with the, King, with the Kingborough Dog Walkers on the 3rd of August. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, what did that entail and is there any update um, that you'd like to pass along? Yep. Um, so we have a quarterly um, meeting, the Deputy Mayor and myself, with the Kingborough Dog Walkers Association for a number of issues. Um, it's always a really interesting discussion. Um, I did relay to them that we had considered um, a dog strategy as part of our budget deliberations, but it unfortunately did just um, not quite make the cut. Um, but I have asked the association to think about what um, they would like to see in a strategy when, we, when we're when we able to do that in the future. Um, they wanted to talk about whether we had any powers as a council to declare 
um, not just dogs but all animals, but I think specifically from where they were coming from, dogs as sentient beings um, so that when dogs are, or other animals um, are being harmed that it, we have more powers then to uh, remove them from harm's way because we know we've all read about cases where the RSPCA haven't had those sorts of powers available to them. And uh, I did write back to them today just to let them know that that is a, a difficult issue for us because we don't really have the statutory power to do that or make a bylaw to do that. It would only be just a, a bit of a um, uh, tokenistic response. It needs to come at a state level. I do know that, so for example, the ACT have declared dogs as sentient beings. Um, so, but that's an issue that they're... and. Uh, that they've been working on and they do have um, a animal behaviourist um, veterinarian who works with them and who's recently written to the state government about that. Um, and they were also very appreciative of the new water troughs that have been installed at um, the Suncoast track off walk, uh, dog walking area and also the Kingston View Drive um, area. And we're also installing another one uh, at... Drew Point shortly as well. Um, they're just quite low troughs and apparently they've been very well used by um, the dogs that are visiting there with their owners. Um, so, yeah, we just have a general discussion about we, where we could make improvements. We've had a, a long um, standing discussion about the difficulties of the uh, biodegradable dog poo bags and where they go. Um, so there's always different issues that we chat about, but we try to make that a quarterly thing. It's a good learning experience for me as a non-dog owner as well. <laughs> now, there was a planning matter that was dealt with today regarding Blackman's Bay. It's always good to go onto the YouTube channel from the Kingborough Council and actually check out um, how that debate went down. But I voted against that one and I laid out my reasons uh, in that contribution. So rather than get into it here, I think it's worth um, checking out my contribution for that uh, development application. Then the next thing we talked about was the biodiversity policy. And this was a really major decision that took place tonight. And without bearing the lead, essentially, I voted against it. Now, the reason why is because currently to knock down a tree of very high conservation value in Kingborough, it is now $570 is the financial offset that one would have to pay. Now, without getting into a whole big thing, I just don't think that that's enough. I think that we significantly undervalue um, the ecosystem services, the contributions to our health and well-being and amenity that high conservation value trees and very high conservation value trees provide to our municipality. I want to be very clear that the, the council staff do an incredible job, particularly in our natural areas and biodiversity uh, team. There's, there's so much good work and a lot of what's in that biodiversity offset policy is really, really important stuff. But the fact is that I just couldn't bring myself to vote for something that I didn't feel was uh, was was right. I felt like um, we're endorsing uh, the idea that it's okay to uh, pay a financial offset, which is, in my opinion, too small. And so I actually moved an amendment to that motion to try and increase the uh, financial offset that uh, that can be paid up to five thousand seven hundred dollars per very high conservation value tree, and three thousand four hundred dollars per high conservation value tree. Now, bearing in mind that within the council agenda, you can see the actual definitions of what um, counts for that. So we're talking about uh, trees with diameters at breast height of more than 70 centimetres, but there's a lot of different, uh, depending on the species and things like that. You've got to really check out the council agenda and the, and the policy itself in order to see what those details are. But in essence, I feel like here in Tasmania, we don't actually value the trees to the same extent that they do for example, in the city of Melbourne, there's one highly publicised case where because the city of Melbourne uh, applies a multiplier effect that includes the species, the location, the type of tree that we're talking about, the age of the tree, they include those ecosystem services in their tree valuation. And there was one highly publicised case where a developer was required to pay $62,500 per tree to remove four trees in order to do the de development that they wanted. Now, that's because in that part of Melbourne, they recognised that these trees are important. They're providing important services and they actually need to be valued. And if you just think about it in terms of, you know, the common sense of it, um, to to try and buy a 100-year-old eucalyptus viminalis that it has nesting hollows, you, you just can't buy it. I mean, it even if you were to try and buy an established tree, 
uh, even a tree in a 20 liter pot is going to send you back, you know, $570. So I really felt like what we want to be doing is to try to disincentivize major developers, particularly, but really all people who have the opportunity to avail themselves of another option, you know, either build in a different place, build around nature, build in harmony with nature rather than building against nature. And don't use that financial offset as, as a first resort. It should always be a last resort. Now, biodiversity offsets are measures that compensate for impacts when alternatives have been exhausted. So in this hierarchy that I'm talking about, first of all, you want to try and avoid biodiversity habitat loss. If you can't do that, then you want to minimize that impact. And if you can't do that, you want to mitigate that impact. If you can't do that, then, and only then should you be thinking about offsetting. And when offsetting happens, direct offsets are the most desirable. Now that includes part five agreements, conservation covenants, bushland reserves, on-site restoration or on-site rehabilitation. And then after all that's exhausted, if you can't do any of that, then we can start to talk about financial offsets. And when we do talk about financial offsets, we should be making it a significant financial contribution so that people don't use it as a first resort, they use it as a last resort. Now, a lot of people quite rightly raise this issue. Well, not every developer is created equal. Some developers are really high cap investors who have a lot of money who are doing a subdivision with 100 houses and they can probably afford to pay $5,000 per tree. But what about a regular investor who doesn't have as much money, a regular developer, what happens to them? And so that's why in the amendment that I tried to get passed, and unfortunately the amendment did not get up, which is very sad, it nearly got up, but it didn't. Um, I had a fourth dot point that was to include a financial hardship policy provision that meant that for those people who couldn't afford to pay that offset, there was some flexibility in the policy, that there was some leniency where the general manager or the chief financial officer or the manager finance could make a determination that that person was undergoing financial hardship, therefore they could not pay, um, and therefore there would be flexibility in that. So I had this financial hardship provision, and basically it came down to a conversation about whether or not the financial hardship policy, which was initially developed as a result of the COVID pandemic, whether or not that could be applied in the case of a biodiversity offset policy. And basically the debate uh, included a conversation about whether or not the financial offset that you're paying for biodiversity loss is a contribution or whether it counts as a fee for service or a um, or, or a charge, a fee or a fine. And the reason why that's important uh, as whether it's a penalty or whether it's a contribution is if it's a penalty or a service charge or a rate, then it can be included in the financial hardship policy. But if it's a contribution, well, the financial hardship policy doesn't mention anything about a contribution. And therefore, um, the determination was that it couldn't be included. So look, a pretty technical point, um, pretty, um, I guess, semantic kind of point. And yet that's kind of where the debate ended up. And unfortunately, we we lost that amendment. You know, the amendment that I put up to actually put some strength behind the financial offset aspect of the biodiversity policy did not get up. Um, I also included in that amendment was to adjust the financial offset to be adjusted annually, indexed to the consumer price index, basically adjusted for inflation. I feel like there's a lot more work to be done. There is good work being done by the biodiversity policy, but in the end, I couldn't bring myself to vote for something that I didn't think was good enough. I didn't think it was, um, I didn't think it, it fit the community expectations. I've certainly heard from a lot of people who really care about trees in Kingborough, and they think that developers shouldn't be uh, given carte blanche to destroy precious habitat. We've got the swift parrot, we've got the 40 spotted partalote. These are, these are, just two examples of organisms that are really right on the brink and we need to be doing everything we can to protecting their habitat, uh, not just for those species, but for the good of us all. So that was the biodiversity offset policy, quite a controversial topic. Councillor Cordover. Thank you, ma'am. I'm going to start with some questions and then I'll do my substantive and it's uh, very carefully timed. Um, so let me start by thanking the author and the authoriser of the report and sincerely express my gratitude for their impressive work. Uh, my first question is clause, uh, clause 2.8.4 on, it's page 96 of our agenda, but it's page two of the um, 
the policy. So looking at page 96, it defines a special circumstance where development that may justify reduction in biodiversity may include the development is located on an existing title for a single dwelling and or associated outbuilding. And so I note that 6.13 explains that a financial offset may only be used where there's no opportunity for on-site or off-site off -site offsets. Um, however, basically my question is, please explain what clause 2.8.4 means. Does it mean that all development that occurs on a single dwelling title will automatically be considered eligible to use a, a financial offset under the biodiversity policy if, if they can't find space on-site or off-site? Or is that, is clause 2.8.4 still discretionary as to whether or not it counts as a special circumstance? Ms. Denexter? Through you, Mayor. Um, I just want to double check I understand the question. So if, if a um, development meets 2.84, it will count as a special circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, and then it may or may not be a financial contribution or, or an on-site or off-site offset, depending on, on what capacity there is on that site and what alternatives there are off-site. So all the special circumstances um, doing is allowing it to proceed to consideration of an offset. So if you don't meet any of the special circumstances, offsets are off the table altogether. Yeah. But if you meet one of those, including 2.84, then we look to what the appropriate offset is in that particular circumstance and whether it's financial or um, in situ or off-site conservation, on-site or off-site. Thank you. Um, further to that, what I guess I'm trying to figure out why 2.84 is in there. When I, when I initially read it, I kind of thought, oh, that means anyone with a single dwelling title is kind of, um, kind of gets special treatment. And, but am, am I misinterpreting that? Uh, not, not really. The intention is that if there is an existing title and its zoning allows for a residential development, that it's reasonable for them to, to be considered against the rest of the tests and not be precluded because it doesn't meet one, two or three. It's not going to be important socially and economically, so it can't meet one as a special circumstance. Number two is whether the, the values are really, really poor condition, so it may not meet that. Um, and three is designed for sites where you do have enough elsewhere on the site and you're only having a small impact. So we, did, we didn't have that special circumstance two policies ago and a planning scheme ago <laughs> and it, it resulted in some blocks being undevelopable and um, it was our view that that wasn't reasonable, that those people should have the opportunity to build a single dwelling on those properties if um, they offset that impact. Thank you. That's, um, yeah, that's a really important point and thanks for that clarification. Uh, number two, uh, my question, my second question, clause 6.9, so I'm now looking at page 98 and I'm looking at pa uh, clause 6.9. Details, um, clause 6.9 details the offsetting plan for recipient land and it reads, quote, management actions for the first five years of implementing the conservation management plan must be costed and bonded. Ongoing management is the responsibility of the landowner or manager and must be undertaken in accordance with the conservation management plan. So my question is, let's take the example of somebody removing a 60 year old eucalyptus viminalis, potential habitat for the swift parrot. The developer chooses option A to have an on-site conservation covenant. The replacement value here is to put six viminalis tube stock or seedlings into the ground to replace that lost 60-year-old tree with nesting hollows. Is it true that clause 6.9 means that only the first five years of that 60-year process are actually costed and bonded? And then after five years, it's up to the landowner manager for the next 55 years to just do the right thing um, and follow the conservation management plan. Um, is, is council confident in taking developers at their word that they'll act in good faith by maintaining the offset for the full life of the replacement tree? Ms Dinexter. Through you, Mayor. Um, so revegetation as an offset option isn't available as the only offset, offset option. So if somebody wants to include revegetation in their offset, it has to be part of a package and complement the broader protection. Um, so it would be a very small component. So we would have to be satisfied that the rest of the offset was achieving um, the outcome and the revegetation was just um, a bonus, if you like. The only real opportunities where 
the revegetation is the entirety of the offset is through the, the payment of the financial contribution and then the responsibility comes to council for, for monitoring that for the very reasons that you've pointed out. The, the reality of um, people planting trees and maintaining them in perpetuity and us monitoring that, it's not, it's not feasible and it's not realistic, which is why it's not on the table as, as an appropriate offset in and of itself. The five-year management actions, um, I can't think of um, any apart from some large subdivisions like Spring Farm where there has been a component of revegetation and the land that's been revegetated is transferred to council and so we are taking it on beyond that five years in those situations but for private land it, it hasn't um, and isn't used as an option within the policy framework. Thank you. Yeah, I can see that it's great when council takes it over that means that in perpetuity we can protect it um, but but wouldn't it have been better to write that clause as being that they'll maintain it in perpetuity? Like, why did we choose five years? Why didn't we choose 10 or 20? Or, as I would have liked, choose 100 years? The obligation is in perpetuity. The management for bonding and costing is simply an obligation to report to us and show us that each year the trees, all the actions are established. So usually five years is enough time to get something to care and maintenance, so the weed control has been undertaken and all the primary weeds are, are in hand and it's just checking. So beyond that five years, the obligation is absolutely there to continue protecting what it is that they've committed to protecting. Um, but, I get, yeah, we're not holding their hand in the same way and it's not bonded. Thank you. My final question is in Table 3. This is page 102 of our Council Agenda, Table 3. The final asterisk at the very bottom of Table 3 reads, quote, where the recipient land contains additional values to the area being impacted, the offset ratio may be reduced at the discretion of Council. My question is, under what circumstances might Council reduce, um, reduce the offset? Uh, are there any examples that we can think of? And, and does it mean, as I fear, that if you have recipient land in your possession that's already good habitat, that your offsetting can be less. We're seeing these a lot with carbon offsets where people are taking land that they already own that they had no intention of damaging and using that as kind of double dipping. They're using land that they were never going to knock the trees over on as, a, as an offset and they're actually getting paid for that in the case of carbon, um, carbon banking. So my question is, does it not contradict Clause 6.6 .6, where an offset proposal is only considered where there are no existing protections uh, and it's not part of an existing natural reserve area? My concern is about people um, saying that they're going to protect land that's already protected or protecting land that they had no intention of damaging and then saying, well, um, now I get a reduced offset because I own this block of, I own this bush block over here. I was never going to touch it, but that counts as my offset. So now I don't have to plant as many um, uh, tube stock. It's Van Exton. Through you, Mayor. Um, you do highlight a, a dilemma and a challenge. There is a risk that um, the way rules are structured can sometimes reward poor management. So if something's in poorer condition, its offset will be less. And what this is acknowledging is if something's in really good condition compared to what's being impacted or its um, conservation value is much higher, so say its threat status is, is endangered instead of rare, they may um, be able to provide a reduced area in offset. So I can think of two examples. One is quite a long time ago, so it was the... Um, the Blue Bush Crescent um, development at Blackman's Bay. That's actually our only example, well, one of two examples actually, of off-site offsets. So the offset for that was at Wingara Road. Um, and at the time, their ratio was reduced um, by both council and the Forest Practices Authority. That was a joint regulatory process then. Um, the actual area required to be protected was reduced because the condition of the values that were being protected in that um, part five agreement were much better than what was being impacted. What was being impacted was quite poor condition. So that was recognised and the area protected was allowed to be reduced in area. Um, the other example um, is Algona Road. So the ratio was slightly reduced because what they were protecting within that site was in much, much better condition and had a lot greater diversity than the area impacted. Um, in terms of whether that's double dipping, Something isn't accepted or considered protected until it actually has a status under either the Land Use Planning Act or on the Nature Conservation Act or in public ownership. So 
um, it would have, and and then we wouldn't accept it as an offset. So I don't think there's a risk of double dipping, but certainly there might be some savvy people out there that, you know, do potentially, you know, perhaps not manage their land as well as they could and get rewarded for that by um, having a, a lower offset or they could be sitting on some land that's a great offset and if that's the case, we still get the conservation outcome. It's, yeah, so it's a, tri it's a tricky one because the planning scheme doesn't regulate use in the context of these values. It only regulates development. So we have very little control over whether somebody's, um, yeah, perhaps overgrazing, overburning, not managing their weeds. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate that. And um, and I really do appreciate the amazing work of our Natural Areas Biodiversity team. It's important work and our council is very lucky to have such passionate and diligent staff to undertake it. Here goes my substantive contribution, Mayor, if you please. Um, biodiversity offsets are measures that compensate for residual impacts when alternatives have been exhausted. The aim is to, and this is from most desirable to least desirable, to um, to minimise, to, to mitigate, and then as a last resort to use offsets, and direct offsets are the most desirable. That is part five agreements, conservation covenants, bushland reserves, on-site restoration, on-site rehabilitation. Now, I recognise that these offsets we're talking about are a last resort, and I've been told that biodiversity offsets are designed to offset lost habitat, and they're not designed to be a penalty or a disincentive for developers. And I've been told that not all developers are created equal. Some are large cap investors that can afford to pay, while others are, are small cap developers who can't afford to pay. And I fundamentally believe that offsetting for biodiversity loss and disincentivizing developers for destroying Kingborough's precious habitat are not mutually exclusive quantities. We can have both at the same time, and I propose that we should. I think we need to differentiate between the size of a developer, so a large institutional developer may need to pay more than, than a mum and dad, um, you know, building a shed or something. Similarly, we need to account for the time lost in growing a tree to a suitable size to become valuable habitat. When a developer removes an 80-year-old blue gum with nesting hollows, replacing that eucalyptus viminalis with six seedlings from the nursery just doesn't cut the mustard, in my opinion. I believe we're currently setting our sites too low and we're compromised by a tyranny of low expectations. Specifically, in clause 6.15, table one, offsetting options, in subclause C, this is the financial offsets, and you can see it on page 99 of our agenda. The biodiversity policy proposes a maximum financial offset of up to $570 per tree of very high conservation value. This is a very fancy way of saying that Kingborough Council is significantly undervaluing our high conservation value trees. Meanwhile, other jurisdictions properly value the social, economic, health and wellbeing and ecosystem services that high conservation value trees offer. The median house price in Kingston is now $829,000, with many suburbs in Kingborough, whether it's Taruna, Tinderbox, Kingston Beach or Blackman's Bay, now closing in on a million dollar median house price. So this policy is saying loud and clear that in Kingborough, we value our very high conservation value trees at a rate of about one five thousandth of a median house. We think a hundred year old tree with nesting hollows could be worth as much to our ecosystem as nearly half of 0.1% of the house that is replacing it. A hundred year old tree in return for six seedlings from a nursery is not good enough. You can read about it on page 33 of the Hobart City Council street tree strategy and I quote, the city of Melbourne assigns a base value relative to the width of the trunk at breast height and applies a multiplier thereafter for species, aesthetics, locality and condition. In one widely publicised case, the City of Melbourne demanded an inner city developer pay $62,500 per tree to replace four trees removed during the remodelling of their premises. And that is exactly why I would like to move an amendment and this amendment is to table one, option C, financial offsets, to read. Financial offsets are calculated at a rate of up to $5,700 per tree of very high conservation value and up to $3,400 for high conservation value trees as identified in table two, or $136,500 per hectare of high and moderate biodiversity value as identified and subject to the replacement ratios in table three. The third dot point would read, these financial offsets are indexed annually to the consumer price index, are inclusive of a 20% administration fee and are reviewed periodically in conjunction with the policy. And finally, an, applica an applicant may be eligible for consideration for hardship assistance in accordance with council's financial <laughs> hardship policy 1.18. So the amendment in layman's terms 
is to times by 10 the amount uh, that is currently suggested. It's to times it by 10, but crucially, it is to adjust it to inflation, and it's also to add in a hardship clause. And the genius of this is that, well, <laughs> genius is a strong word. Um, the, the important aspect of this is that people who can't afford it can utilise council's hardship provisions, but people who can afford it will have to pay for the trees they knock over. So that's the amendment I'm moving, and I'm seeking a seconder for that, if I may. Seconded, uh, Councillor Midgley. Um, okay, so we're now debating the amendment. Did you want to say anything further on that? I do. The, the, thank you, Mayor. The, the City of Melbourne uses a much more robust framework for valuing trees. Biodiversity offsets are a last resort, so it is unusual for these offsets to be called into use. However, when they are called into use, financial offsets, they should be so significant that everyone is clear that they have to do their utmost to avoid using those financial offsets. Offsets are a last resort, and by having real monetary disincentives, it will avoid developers using offsets as a, as a first resort. It will avoid them from using it as just a cost of doing business. Everybody agrees, I think, that for a major developer with $100 million, $570 a tree is just not a lot. It's a cost of doing business. But we know that some people are not wealthy developers. Some people are just regular households. And so for those people, there is a provision under our hardship policy, which already exists, for the general manager, the chief financial officer, or the manager of finance to use their discretion in accordance with our council's financial hardship policy to ensure that those small cap developers are not slugged with the same costs as big time subdivisions. Critically, the procedure policy detail of the financial hardship policy reads, 5.1, a ratepayer may be eligible for consideration for hardship assistance in the payment of rates, service charges, interest and penalties, where the person is unable to pay their charges when due or payable for reasons beyond their control, or 5.1.2, payment would cause the person hardship. So it's basically at the discretion of the general manager or the manager of finance or the chief financial officer we can recognise when a ratepayer will face financial hardship and, and our policy on financial hardship explains what evidence and, um, is, is required, but it also explains you know, the, the privacy around that. We have the capacity to ensure that those who can afford to pay uh, and those who can't afford to pay can utilise the provisions of the hardship policy. Uh, critically, it will help incentivise developers large and small to consider carefully their options before going down the road of a financial offset. Remember, the ideal situation is to avoid minimise, and then, as a last resort, to offset. The most desirable outcome is to avoid habitat loss in the first place. But where none of this can be achieved, there must be a significant disincentive from just chopping it down, throwing some coins into the offset jar. And my amendment will make financial offsets a last resort, not an easy way out. By utilising our existing financial hardship policy, no councillor can make the claim that we are unfairly burdening developers. My understanding is that our financial assistance policy is in line with Legat's financial hardship policy model, which has a clear set of principles, which include consistent, equitable and respectful treatment for all residents and ratepayers that's sensitive to their specific circumstances, assisting ratepayers who are suffering serious financial hardships so that they may overcome those circumstances and return to financial stability, ensure that those who are able to contribute to local services continue to do so, and minimising the opportunity for misuse, exploitation or fraud by ensuring decisions made to provide special relief or assistance are supported by sufficient evidence, and finally, maintaining confidentiality and privacy. So my amendment seeks to achieve three things. To ensure that we use this biodiversity financial offset as a last resort, and that all feasible options in the hierarchy minimise and mitigate impacts have actually been exhausted before we use them. Secondly, to introduce sufficient flexibility to the policy to ensure that those who can afford to pay do. And finally, to ensure that the quantum of the offset is indexed to keep Thanks, pace folks. with inflation. I urge you all to support my amendment. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, the General Manager just wanted to add something in relation to the hardship policy. Yep. Thank you, Mayor, and through you. Uh, Councillor Cordova, the dilemma that I have is that the final dot point of your amendment is uh, at odds with the wording of the current financial policy that Council has in place. He just asked how. <laughs> I'll uh, just interpret for you. <laughs> yep, yep, through you, Mayor. If I can just read it out, Councillors. It currently says that a ratepayer may be eligible for consideration for hardship assistance in the payment of rates, service charges, interest and penalties. 
Sorry, is this a service charge? My interpretation is that this is a service charge or a penalty. A financial offset would be a service charge or a penalty. Not when you read the policy. Through you, Mayor, I, I don't believe Council's financial, financial hardship policy had the offset policy in mind when it was prepared, and that's not how I interpret it, Councillor Cordova. So my question would be, if, through you, Mayor, if it's not a service fee, if it's not a penalty, if it's not a fee, a fine or a charge, what is the financial offset? It's a monetary payment to council. What, what is it, if not what's listed in that um, financial hardship policy? And is it not true that the intention of the policy is to be a catch-all for any fee, fine or service charge? What is the charge? Through you, Mayor, if I may. The financial offset policy is designed for those ratepayers uh, finding themselves in times of hardship in relation to the payment of their rates. And uh, I can only repeat um, what I said a few minutes ago, Councillor Cordova, it's not how I interpret the policy. Councillors may beg to differ. Thank you. And just a procedural question through you, Mayor. Uh, can we, by amending this policy, I assume that we can't at the same time amend the financial no. policy um, no. and so but I think my question still stands that if uh, my question remains what is this charge if it's not a service charge what what is it Ms Vanek Vanek through you Mayor the way I would describe it is it's a contribution that's required to satisfy the planning scheme so another example is a public open space policy yeah public open space contribution and I can't imagine that the hardship policy would be utilised to sidestep a public open space contribution for um, a subdivision, for example. So I'm not, I'm not clear how, how it could be used in the case of, of the offset policy either. Thank you. So through you, Mayor, I think in light of this advice, the, the most prudent way forward, I think, would be to strike the fourth dot point and then debate the amendment on its merits without that fourth dot point. Okay, so your amendment now is just the three dot points, so... Unless, I'm reading the room now, unless other people agree with my interpretation that it's a fee or a charge, rather than the general manager's interpretation, which is a, it's a contribution. Well, you can't actually take a straw poll right now of that. You need okay. to either withdraw it and move on, <laughs> otherwise it's going to be a really long yeah, night. I will... Um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll remove it, because we want to save trees in Kingborough, so... Okay, so yeah. Mrs. Morton, could you just please remove that last dot point so we can be clear? Uh, yeah, does uh, who seconded the Councillor Midgley? Do you agree with um, that? Thank you. Okay, all right. Can we get back to? I think your time might be up, Councillor Cordova. Any further speakers? Now we're speaking on the amendment. Councillor Street, then Councillor Midgley. Councillor Cordova. A question, you please. Yeah, two questions. Yeah. My first question is actually about that inflation, um, the CPI. My understanding, and the reason why I put in this dot point about indexing into CPI. My understanding is the reason why we're raising the rate from 500 to 570 is to adjust for the inflation between when we invented this fee or contribution to now. But my belief is that it's not indexed to inflation going forward. So we all we have as a provision is just to update this periodically. But my amendment is actually making it annually indexed to CPI. So can we just hear some clarity about whether or not this policy as it stands uh, is annually indexed to adjust for inflation? Ms Quinn. Through you, Mayor. No, it's not. Thank just you. bear in mind Second that as a council we have the opportunity to ask for the policy to be reviewed at any time, not just for when it's due for renewal in another five years. So That's true. Yeah. Thank you. And the second question is, do I get a right of reply for the I amendment? Was, that's what I, I was about to ask you oh, to do I, before I you threw a question. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, why do we need to achieve more when we're achieving all we want to achieve at the moment? A central question, and I think we're not achieving enough. We have here in Kingborough two bird species that I can think of, swift parrot and 40-spotted partilote, for which they're more rare than a white rhino or a giant panda, and yet apparently we're reaching our goals. I think our goals need to be a bit more lofty. So this debate came down to whether it's the perfect getting in the way of the good, and it came down to a definition, sadly, of a financial offset being a contribution as opposed to being a service charge. I tried to add in a clause about financial hardship. The City of Melbourne is, is happily um, charging people who can afford it 
when they do knock over high conservation value trees. And as I mentioned in my substantive, the median house price in Kingborough is a million dollars. It's near closing in on a million dollars now. So I think the time where we can say little old Tassie is different from the mainland is that time has passed now. We're talking about big developers, big subdivisions that take place where $570 per tree is just a cost of doing business. And Councillor Bastone was absolutely right that you couldn't buy a 20 litre pot with a big tree in it um, for, for $570. And yet we're supposed to believe that a 100 year old Viminalis is only worth 570. It doesn't pass the pub test. We should have had a fourth dot point in here to talk about a hardship clause to differentiate between high cap subdivision developers versus small developers, whether it's by using our existing financial hardship policy or indeed inventing a new one that is bespoke for the biodiversity offset policy. But the fact remains that right now we're not charging enough for trees and there are people who are laughing all the way to the bank because this is a cost of doing business as they knock over precious biodiversity habitat in our municipality. And the question then becomes, who are we supposed to believe? Are we supposed to believe our own eyes where so many people we've heard from Councillor Fox today to talk about Blackman's Bay and the changes there? Are we supposed to believe that we're meeting all of our goals or are we supposed to believe our own eyes where we're constantly seeing these high conservation value trees getting knocked over throughout our municipality? And the proof is in the pudding that we've had over a million dollars go into that offset account. A million dollars represents hundreds upon hundreds, thousands of trees getting knocked over for 500 bucks a piece. As you can tell from the community outreach about tree protection that we've had throughout my years on this council, I hope that after the upcoming local government elections in October, we will have a council with the political will to vastly improve this vision for tree retention and preservation in Kingborough. I'd like to see a council with a grand vision for protecting habitat, restoring and rehabilitating more vegetation communities and actively disincentivizing developers, both large and small, from taking unnecessary steps that they don't need to take. They should be building around, building with, building in harmony with nature, not building in contravention of it and destroying our precious biodiversity. And we will all be on record tonight when we vote for this amendment about whether or not we think trees are worth more than $570 a pop. Um, and I think the community will judge us accordingly. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. So I'm going to put the amendment now. The amendment was moved by Councillor Cordova, seconded by Councillor Midgley. All those in favour of the amendment? Against? No. A show of hands. All those in favour of the amendment is Councillors Cordova, Midgley and Bastone. Those against? It's Councillors Wass, Gladewright, Fox, Street, Westwood and Reet. The amendment is lost. We're back on the substantial motion, but I think most... Uh, any more contributions on the substantive motion? Um, if not, I'm going to put the substantive motion um, going back. It's as printed on the screen, A, B, C and D. Um, it was moved by Councillor Westwood and seconded by Councillor Fox. All those in favour? Against? Okay, show of hands is required. All those in favour is Councillors Wass, Midgley, Gladewright, Fox, Street, Bastone, Westwood and Reet. And those against, Councillor Cordova, the motion is carried. It's just after seven o'clock. So what I might do now is share my screen and that way you can see the council agenda. And this is what it looks like and you can find it online for yourself. So scrolling down to see what the other issues were that we talked about today, we had the uh, awards policy, which is now going to be called the Kingborough Community Awards, and there were no uh, changes to that policy. So we just uh, basically every few years we have to update these policies and just make sure they're still fit for purpose. This one was. Then there was the payment of councillors' expenses and provision of facilities policy. Then really exciting, I seconded the event support grants pilot. And in essence, this is funding for events that are going on in Kingborough. I recommend that you check that out because there's some really exciting things happening uh, in that Love Living Locally space. Um, that was first delivered in 2011 and it ran each year after that until 2020. And then of course we had this pandemic. Uh, things have changed since then, but council is really still, in my opinion, committed to um, undertaking really great events that um, that are inclusive, that are accessible, that are fun and interesting, and that get the get the community feeling that uh, that inclusive spirit and you know as it says in the key priority area, engaging and supporting a safe, healthy and connected community. And that's really what we're doing here. So that was exciting. I was really pleased to second that motion. Then there was the annual plan 2022-2023. I strongly encourage jump on the council website when it's made available and check out the annual plan because there's a lot of good stuff in that. The annual plan runs through what council is doing over the next year. 
as opposed to the annual report, which takes a look at what the council did during that year. So um, here we are. The, our vision is to put the community at the heart of everything we do. Our purpose is to make Kingborough a great place to live and our values are accountability, respect, excellence and inclusiveness. I thought was really good about that report was our commitment to our net zero emissions target by 2035, which is something that, um, that we managed to implement. And it was um, my amendment that managed to bring that target down from 2050 to 2035. And I'm really pleased we did that. And now we just need to um, make sure that it's adequately resourced uh, that we get there. But we know that like something like 93% of all council emissions are coming from waste to landfill. So that's why waste reduction targets are really important. And having that waste reduction strategy will go a long way to, to seeing us be a net zero emissions council by 2035. Um, a coastal hazard adaptation policy, undertaking the snug climate action um, climate change adaptation project and also encouraging greater uptake of FOGO. It's about half of people who can get FOGO are currently availing themselves of it. Uh, but in terms of bushfire preparedness, robust emergency management, upgrading our existing two-way radio system with digital mobile radio system to improve operational communications and safety in emergency management situations. I think preparing for natural disaster is a really key element of keeping the community safe. I think it's something we can focus on. Uh, and it's something that I'm really making a priority of mine is to um, get to come to terms with what council needs to do to best help communities prepare to be adaptable and resilient in the face of climate change. We're seeing more frequent and severe weather events. We need to be prepared. We're seeing this already with the heavy downpours we're getting this week. We've seen it with fires. We've seen it with floods on the mainland. Uh, we need to do everything we can to be prepared. And I think it behoves our leadership to uh, keep that at front of mind. Then... Here was a big one. I moved a motion on facial recognition technology and biometric data capture. Thank you, Beth. This motion is about Kingborough Council taking leadership to allay community fears about the increasing encroachment on civil liberties. It's about stopping in its tracks the ability of a future council to collect, store, and pass along personal data of Kingborough residents and their children that council, to be frank, has no business to collect. This motion is about our strategic goal, 2.3, of having community facilities that are safe, accessible, and meet contemporary standards. Facial recognition technology and biometric data capture is a digital fingerprint. It is equivalent to collecting and storing a fingerprint or a swab of saliva for DNA. Ask yourself, when you go into a hardware store or a clothing store with your child, or indeed when you stop by council to use the recycling kiosk in the reception, would it be appropriate for one of the employees to insist on collecting a copy of your child's fingerprint or taking a DNA swab? Ask yourself, would it be appropriate for your child playing at Kingston Park to have a council officer collect their fingerprint or take a DNA swab off the play equipment? The only data that council should be collecting on people in the public domain is data that is necessary, proportionate and reasonable. To say you don't care about privacy because you have nothing to hide is the same as saying you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. As we were told by council's chief information officer in response to my question on notice on the 1st of August, quote, most commercially available CCTV recording systems have facial recognition capability that can be configured and activated, end quote. And we know that council owns and manages um, some CCTV and we also know that Tasmania Police operates some of and monitors some of the council's CCTV. Is it necessary, proportionate, and reasonable for our playgrounds, our civic centre, our sports facilities, our bathrooms and our parks to have technology that can collect face prints? No, it clearly is not. It is unreasonable. Even if we had a policy on it, which we don't, it would be unreasonable. Adelaide City Council found it unreasonable. San Francisco didn't think it was reasonable. The European Parliament didn't think it was reasonable. Now, we all leave digital crumbs, digital exhaust, a digital trace every day in basically everything we do. And I acknowledge that we may not be able to stop Tasmania police from using our camera footage for facial recognition purposes. I acknowledge, indeed, that if you use basically any product from one of the tech giants, that you're probably already caught up in a web of digital surveillance. I realise that a single council motion won't solve a world riddled with these problems. But what I'm putting forward is a motion in the spirit of thinking globally and acting locally. We can control what council does. We can control what we do and how we use our CCTV. As a council, we can draw a line in the sand and set a good example for others. We can let our community know that even if other government agencies, even if other private sector authorities find it advantageous to trample all over our digital rights, as a council, we are knitted from a stronger moral fibre.
We know that we have no business as a council collecting and storing your children's face prints and then passing those along to third parties. In June this year, controversy over Adelaide's plans to upgrade its CCTV with face, face recognition capability led the council to vote unanimously not to purchase the necessary software. The council then asked South Australia Police not to use facial recognition technology until legislation is in place to govern its use. Adelaide City Council voted unanimously not to include the technology in its new security cameras being installed across the CB. D. According to Innovation Oz, quote, the long running review of Australia's privacy law will present a final report to government by the end of 2022 as the new Attorney General seeks to curtail the, quote, highly invasive use of personal information. For Council, our Council here in Kingborough, to be best prepared for this new legislation framework, we would do well to clean up our Digital Act ready for those tighter legal frameworks, making sure we have clear policies and procedures in place to ensure that Kingborough Council is only collecting information that is necessary, proportionate and reasonable. Now, we've all heard those stories from overseas where jurisdictions have adopted facial recognition technology and biometric data capture and they're using it irresponsibly. We've heard those dystopian stories about social credit scores where jaywalking too many times or rocking up to work too many times late in the morning and it results in your bank account being frozen or you being blocked from using public transport or prohibited from attending sporting events. We know that in the USA, if you participated in the BLM movement or protested the Roe v Wade Supreme Court decision, you likely had your biometric data captured and stored. No matter what side of politics you're on, your council has no business collecting and storing a copy of your face print and you should be concerned. Not only does this technology have flaws that gives false positives, not only is it used to over-police neighbourhoods, not only is it used to on-sell to advertisers, but it is a fundamental infringement on your right to be a peaceful law-abiding citizen and not have unnecessary search and seizure of your personal information. That's why we must oppose it, that's why we must ban it, time. and that's why we're on the record tonight Thank to you. know your where time we stand has on expired. the issue. Thank you, Councillor Cordover. You. Councillor West. Otherwise, I'm going to ask Councillor Cordover if you'd like to sum up. Thank you, Mayor. This is about leadership. It's about controlling what we can control. The analogue that I drew is, is not about scaremongering. It's about the reality that when you take somebody's digital fingerprint, their face print, that is analogous. It is the same as... Well, the point, it is the same thing. It is the same thing. So if you're uncomfortable with that notion, then you should also be uncomfortable with the notion of council having CCTV in public places capturing this information which can easily be upgraded and passed along to third parties. This is the reality of the world that we live in, in which the regulation has not caught up to speed with the use of technology. And we've heard the consumer report from Choice in June this year that said many high street retailers, including ones in Kingra, are using this technology. Now, this for council is about drawing a line in the sand. Now is a good time for council to act, not just in light of the Choice report, to send a clear message to the community that we care and that we are alert to these issues, but also because the changes being ushered into the Privacy Act will mean that there will be a tighter regulatory framework. And so council has no business collecting this information and we shouldn't collect this information and it will cost us more in the long run to have to rectify that. We might as well do it now. Two dozen cities in the United States, the city of Adelaide, the European Parliament, they all think it's wrong and they've taken steps to elevate the need for, for regulation to catch up. They've taken the lead and we should do the same thing as well. Saying you don't care about this issue because you have nothing to hide is like saying that you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. Saying that just because council doesn't use it now doesn't mean that a future council won't and saying that there's no chance that council will use it, I think, I believe, is actually quite naive to the reality of the speed at which this technology is changing and the uptake among private sector organisations and government authorities to utilise this information and for them to request it from councils. So that's why the City of Adelaide took the steps that they did and that's why we should do the same. Tonight, each of us at this table can either put our heads in the sand and pretend like this isn't an issue that the community cares about, pretend like this isn't an issue that's on the horizon for all of us. We can pretend like there's no problem, nothing to see here, but we know from jurisdictions overseas that this is a big problem and it is something that council... You, you can't claim that this isn't a council issue and it's irrelevant. These are our cameras on our property that are managed by us. How could you claim that this isn't a council issue? It's our cameras. So I've made the point very clear that the regulation has not caught up to the use of the technology. The technology is currently being used irresponsibly by some parties. And I think that we should stand up as a leader in 
Tasmania. Councillor Court, over your three minutes sum up has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to put the motion. It was moved by Councillor Cordova, um, seconded by Councillor Midgley. All those in favour? Against? No. A show of hands is required. All those in favour? In favour is Councillors Cordova, Midgley, Fox, Bastone. Yep. Against is Councillors Wass, Gladewright, Street, Westwood and Reet. The motion is lost. The next motion that I moved tonight was about asking council to provide a report on curbing, disincentivising or prohibiting whole dwelling, that is whole of house or whole of apartment, short stay visitor accommodation in residential areas. If you look at Hobart City Council, they've recently um, looked into planning scheme amendments. Uh, they're looking into differential rating systems. So that is, if somebody has a whole dwelling that is an entire home, that they've taken off the long-term rental market and now they're using it for short-stay visitor accommodation, they're running it as a business, they should be charged commercial rates as opposed to being charged regular residential rates. So this is something that Hobart City Council is looking at. Uh, there's other places, Brisbane City Council recently, um, I know that Noosa Council, Byron Shire Council, they're all implementing various different uh, options for trying to incentivise bringing back long-term rentals onto the rental market. Um, a motion submitted by Councillor Cordover in relation to a report into entire home short-stay accommodation. And there is a officer's response from Ms Tyler Moore. So I've got a mover in Councillor Cordover and I'm looking for a seconder, please. Seconded by Councillor Midgley. Councillor Cordover. Thank you, Mayor. We're in a housing crisis. Soon there will be a new council and those councillors should have all the information they need at their fingertips to make a good decision and to hit the ground running when they come on board to address in a meaningful way, take action and steps to mitigate the housing crisis that Kingborough faces. This motion recognises that now at the end of our term, we shouldn't take drastic action ourselves. We're coming up to a caretaker period, but instead this motion seeks to prepare all the evidence and information required to give a new set of councillors a report that they can pick up in the new, in the new term and give them an informed conversation around home, whole home rentals and short stay visitor accommodation in Kingborough. The motion asks just for a report, it is not a ban. Recent actions taken to regulate whole dwelling short stay visitor accommodation by Brisbane City Council, Noosa Council, Byron Shire and Hobart City Council mean that there are lessons now to be learned from those experiences. That's what makes this an opportune time to get this report prepared. There are many options, planning scheme amendments, these are being looked at by Hobart City Council, differential rating systems, permit caps, and applying commercial rates. There are geospatial considerations. Maybe the report will come back and say, we should only think about this for residential areas, or maybe it will say something else. As of the beginning of August 2022, the website Inside Airbnb claims that Kingborough has 327 entire homes or apartments listed on Airbnb. New research has shown that 327 whole homes taken off the rental market has driven down rental vacancy rates in Greater Hobart, and econometric data indicates clearly this is causing a very significant upward pressure on the cost of renting and the ability of people in Kingborough to find rentals. Rent levels are the result of the balance between supply and demand in a housing market. A summary measure of this balance is the rental vacancy rate, which is what I refer to in this report. That rate is calculated by taking the total number of dwellings available to rent and dividing that by the total number of rental dwellings multiplied by 100 to get a percentage. Economist Sol S. Lake has said that if the, rent, the vacancy rate is above 2.5%, then rates of rent tend to be stable. But if that vacancy rate drops to less than 1%, that generates double digit rent increases. And that's what we're seeing in Greater Hobart, Kingborough included. Local councils across Australia are grappling with the impact of whole dwelling, entire home, short stay accommodation, exacerbating the housing crisis. This motion is asking for a report. Hobart City Council is already well advanced down this path and uh, we should do potentially the same, but the, um, the, the idea is to get all of the different options, whether that's planning scheme amendments, permit caps, or, um, or alternatives, um, put them on the table for the new council to consider. The evidence is now in that a small change in the number of whole home dwellings taken off the long-term rental market and put into short stay is having a direct impact on the rental market. And in Greater Hobart, they found that the withdrawal of just 195 properties from the private rental market can move the vacancy rate from 2%, where rent rises are manageable, to 1%, where 
where rent rises are likely to be over 10%. And I just mentioned that we have 327 of these in Kingborough right now, and there are, there are more to come. In Hobart City Council alone, it was 481 dwellings that were given planning approval for a change of short stay accommodation from 2014 to 2021, December the 31st. This report will not be a single fix. Regulating whole dwelling short stay visitor accommodations is not a single fix. It is, however, low hanging fruit to fix the housing crisis in the short term. And in order to fix the housing crisis in the long term, of course, we need to work with partners in state government and we need to talk about increasing supply, increasing density, rezoning for mixed use, encouraging landholders to turn unused shops, offices and car parks into residences and taxing empty homes. However, right now, we need to get the ball rolling on regulating whole home short stay accommodation and that is what this motion seeks to do. So I urge you to support. Thank you. Councillor Cordova, did you want to sum up? Thank you, Mayor. Some councillors don't like the wording of this motion. They say it's written in the wrong way. They say that they support the intent, but they don't like how it's worded. In To paraphrase one of my esteemed councillor colleagues, let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Isn't that right, Councillor Street? Housing is a human right, and I make no apologies for trying to find solutions to ensure that Kingborough is able to help solve this housing crisis that we all acknowledge we're in. And a crisis means that it's urgent so we've heard the argument today that doing a report would you know, be a bit of a bureaucratic paperwork nightmare for the people who would have to put the report together. And it's much better that they just work on getting houses in the pipeline to build those houses, to get them through the planning process and have them built as quickly as possible. That's how we'll solve the housing crisis. Well, how long does it take to build a home? Is it a week? Is it a month? I think for those people who are facing the pointy end of the housing crisis right now, they would want a faster solution than just waiting for planning staff to approve more houses. I think we have the solution before us. It's evidence-based. And I think a lot of the speculation that we've heard in tonight's debate about why we think Kingborough might be different from Greater Hobart, even though Kingborough is part of Greater Hobart, and I've just pointed to the evidence for it, but a lot of this speculation would be brought out by the report. So what we're trying to do in the report is find out if indeed, maybe councillors Bastone and Street are correct, that Kingborough is substantially different from Hobart. Well, let's find out in the report. If there are other things that are far more important than banning whole dwelling short stay accommodations or curbing them, well, let's find out. Let the experts, let the officers tell us in the report. I have a question. What percentage of development uh, uh, applications presented to this council are passed? Um, that's a legitimate question. My belief is that it's like... My belief is that it's like 95%. We are passing as many development applications as we can. We are contributing to the supply of housing, and that takes years. What we also need to do is think about the other low-hanging fruit that exists, and I pointed to the evidence that whole dwelling short-stay accommodation is exacerbating the housing crisis. That's a fact based on evidence, not on fee opinions. We're just asking for a report in this motion, and the Council, in its strategic plan, promises that we will be an inclusive community that has a strong sense of pride and local identity. We will have best practice land use planning systems in place to manage the current and future impacts of development. That's what this report is seeking to to unpack. We know that there are significant consequences to the economy and society from not dealing with the housing crisis, and this includes Bruni as well. If you look at Byron Bay, they have restaurants that are fancy restaurants where they're serving the food on paper plates because they can't get the staff to wash the dishes. They have places, businesses in, in Byron Bay that are shutting after three and four days in the week because they can't find the staff to afford the rents in Byron Bay, where now one in two houses that used to be on the rental market are now in short stay visitor accommodation. Tell me the Bruni Island's different. We need to be smart about our urban planning. We need to look at a report to ultimately get the new councillors up to speed with the information that they need to take meaningful action on this issue. Thank I'm... you. Thank you, Councillor Cordover. I'm going to put the motion. It's moved by Councillor Cordover, seconded by Councillor Midgley. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Aye. Show of hands is required. All those in favour? Is Councillors Cordover? Midgley, Glade Wright and Fox. Those against? Councillors Wass, Street, Bastone, Westwood and Reit. The motion is lost. The next motion that came up was about housing affordability, asking for the council to lobby uh, to with the Local Government Association of Tasmania to lobby the state government uh, in order to create more affordable housing. And so, of course, I voted for that. That takes us to the end of what was a mammoth council meeting tonight on Monday the 15th of August. 
as I say, it's a really important. This is just my personal opinion, not speaking on behalf of council. Really important that if you're interested in any more of the detail, jump on board the Kingborough Council website, download the minutes and the agenda, and also go to that YouTube channel. And you can see for yourself by, by watching all of the council meeting. As always, if you'd like any more information, don't hesitate to get in touch. My name's Gideon Cordova, and I'll see you at the next Council Roundup. Authorised by G Cordova, Tasmanian Greens, Hobart.